Welcome back. In the first video, I finished up the bottom end. Then, in the last video, I refreshed the cylinder head. Now it's time to put the two back together and finish reassembling the rest of the engine. The first order of business is a new head gasket. It's crucial to make sure everything is as clean as possible before installing it. I'm using an OEM replacement, so it's nothing fancy. It's a stock thickness as well because I didn't get anything remachined. Then I can lift up my cylinder head and try and get it aligned. There's two alignment dowels that it has to be lined up with before it'll fall into place. It's also tricky to get it past the upper timing chain and guide. After some finagling, the cylinder head is seated for now and I can start putting the sprockets back on. I bought a timing tool kit specific to the M54 engine that has a bunch of useful tools. The first is this timing chain tensioner tool that makes it easier to apply tension to the timing chain. I keep going with the timing gears, but then I remember something. It's important to bolt the head down before setting the timing. I learned this in the 3 liter M54 I built. Bolting the head down compresses the head gasket and moves the head closer to the block, shifting the timing. I didn't want to go back and redo the timing again, so I did it right the first time. The washers get reused, and they're a bit tricky to get in place. I oil them up as well to make sure the torques will be accurate. Then I drop all the bolts in place, making sure they're all clean and lubed as well. I went through all the block threads by hand before putting the cylinder head on to make sure they were all clean. All the bolts get snugged, and then I can start the torquing procedure. The head bolts came with this guide that calls out the order and torquing stages. The first stage is 20 newton meters, and then the two additional stages of 90 degrees each. I use my special angle gauge tool to make sure I'm getting the angles right, instead of eyeballing it. Thankfully, this engine is designed so the head bolts can be reached with the cams in place. Otherwise, I have to do the cam installs after torquing down the head. Ten. With the head bolted down, I can move back to the timing system. There's a lot of individual parts here, and I'm not going to cover every single one. I do have the Bentley service manual, which isn't very useful, but it is a good guide for the timing system. Basically, these cups slide in and out to shift the sprockets and thus the timing. There's friction plates and such as well to make sure it stays tight. Thankfully, I tied together my upper timing chain and sprockets, so I don't have to figure out how they were set. I reinstall this with the rest of the intake bits and then I'm ready to get it all lined up. It's important to note that when I installed the cylinder head, I made sure everything was as close to top dead center as possible and didn't spin anything over to make sure there'd be no valve to piston contact before the timing was done. I used one of the timing tools and locked the cams in place with the dots facing up, which is top dead center. This didn't take much turning of the cams for reasons I just explained. I reinstalled the rest of the plates in the cam position gear, but leave it slightly loose. Then I double checked to make sure the crank is exactly at top dead center, which is easy thanks to the mark on the crank pulley. I give the mating surface where the Vanos goes a good clean and make sure the next tool seats properly, which is important. This tool, which is also in the timing kit, pushes in the cups the right amount so that it's in its baseline shifted state. Only now that everything is at top dead center and the cups are correctly placed can I tighten the sprocket nuts and bolts and lock everything in place. Now I can remove the cam locking gear and give it a spin to make sure it retains its setting. I leave the cup holder in place so that nothing shifts. Plus the cups can pop out if you aren't careful and they're hard to get back in. Then after a full cycle, I put the locking tool back in place and put the engine back to top dead center, making sure it still slides in. It still fits, so the timing is all good. Then I do a quick rolling resistance check to see how much torque it takes to spin the engine. It's right around 17 foot-pounds as I remember, which is good. It mostly means nothing is binding. Now it's time to move on to the Vano system. 
This unit here uses oil pressure to shift those cups at the end of the cams in and out, which changes the timing. The disassembly is easy. The exhaust side has four bolts and a helper spring, and the intake has five with no spring. I noticed that these walls with a piston slide have some wear, but it's nothing too concerning. The bigger issue is how filthy the whole unit is. I consider leaving it as is, but I saw some sludge from the pistons. I decide this has to be cleaned up, which requires taking out all the plugs that cap off the oil passages. Once again, I use simple green and hot water from my old kettle that I reassigned to the garage. After soaking and scrubbing for a while, it's clean enough. I give it a good rinse and I'm going to blow dry with compressed air. Now I can move on to the piston seals. Here you can see just how loose the old ones were. This definitely wasn't sealing. This timing advance was not working properly and it would explain the lack of power. The most difficult task is getting the old seals out. The only good way to do it is to pierce the old ring as it's very tough. Once it's broken, it'll come out easily. This then exposes an o-ring beneath it which is easier but still not easy to remove. There's two pairs of these per piston, one pair big and one small. I do my best not to nick the groove to go into and give it a good cleaning before installing the new rings. The inner all rings are easy to install, but the outers are Teflon or something and they're quite stiff. Once finished, the pistons go in and they're quite tight. You're supposed to let them sit in place so the rings bed and seat better. So while I wait, I reinstall all the plugs I took out, making sure there's no debris or water left inside the passages. Finally, I reinstall the plates, not forgetting the metal gaskets or the spring. I give a quick impedance check to the solenoids, and they all match, so it's unlikely any of them are burned out. I even checked a couple spares I had lying around there to make sure they were all the same. Then I reinstall the plunger and the solenoids and the unit's ready to be installed. Before I install the Vanos, I finish up a couple of the remaining tasks. The first is installing the oil level sensor. I couldn't find a new gasket for this, so I applied some ultra gray to it. Then the oil pan can go on with a fresh gasket. I use some ultra gray gasket maker between the seams between the timing cover and block and the rear main seal cover in the block to make sure it doesn't leak. Then I can install a seemingly endless number of oil pan bolts. With that finished, I install the new exhaust studs. I make a jam nut using two spare nuts to get the old studs off. Then I clean up the gasket surface the best I can. I use the same jam nut method to install the new studs. There's 16 studs total, so it's a bit repetitive. Many of the old studs came out with the nuts, which did save me some time. Next I figure it's a good idea to clean the oil filter housing to make sure there's no sludge or dirt from the rest of the engine. I can't seem to get it apart, so I give up and give it a flush with fresh oil instead, making sure to open up the little plastic valve inside. There was some sludge that came out, so now I'm satisfied. Then I can install the new oil filter housing gasket. This is a common failure, and usually it's a lot of work to get to. Of course, I already have the engine apart, so it's easy to take care of. Oh, great.
Next, I install a cam position sensor, coolant crossover pipes, and knock sensors. The crank sensor goes in the bottom right, and I don't install it here, but don't worry, I didn't forget. Now that all your filter housing get bolted on. It's as clean as I can get it, even though it still looks filthy. I don't forget the temp sensor or pressure switch in the housing itself. Then I install the proper timing chain tensioner before replacing the oil filter o-rings and then the new oil filter itself. This cap is important to torque down properly, otherwise there may be a loss of oil pressure. At last, the Vanos assembly can be installed after a new gasket goes on. I get it all bolted down, including the reverse thread screws that go into the cups. The caps and plugs go on and the fan is done. I pop a new rear main seal in. Install a new thermostat. New Vanos oil feed line. And a new water pump. Then the rear main seal goes on, once again not forgetting the gasket. My seal came with this invaluable installation tool which makes slipping the seal over the crank as easy as can be. Then I give all the bolts a good tightening. While I'm back here, I'll make sure to remember the rear oil passage plug. This one is the same as the front and it doesn't bottom out so it needs a thread locker to stay in place. At this point, the engine is done. Well, except for the valve cover. The one I had was cracked, so the customer, which is a fancy word for my friend, is going to install a new one. I hand out the engine to him and give some guidance on the reinstall process. After some time, he finished up the installation all on his own, and it was ready to start. I came by to record how it went, and here's what happened.
Yep. So as you can tell, it doesn't really want to run. It could be a number of things, and I was afraid the timing was off. All right, give it a shot. A little bit of gas, maybe. We swapped the coils to the old ones, which didn't help right away. It did start, though. It still wasn't running great. If I had to guess, I'd say it was a vacuum. We could also hear a sucking noise coming from the intake manifold, which most likely proves my theory. The exhaust was smoking, but this is normal. It's just burning off oil residue and stuff. The engine did have erratic fuel trims, so it was either that or a damaged O2 sensor. It also developed a noisy lifter tick, which I was hoping would go away. After a while, things did seem to improve. So we read around 2K for a little bit, topped off some of the coolant. It's a uh, spill a bunch, so it's all evaporating, but uh, after idling high for a bit, that lifter noise is pretty much gone. Coolant fumes have kicked on, and it's running much better now. Uh, we still have a lean code for bank 2, so it could be something with the O2 sensors. Not sure about that, maybe it's damage or something, so. My buddy still has some work to do to get it driving again and fix that engine issue, be it a vacuum leak, bad injector, or sensor. But for now, my job is done. As always, thanks for watching and feel free to like and subscribe.